Hello, and uh, welcome back to the uh, presentations that I do here at the South Bro Senior Center. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are about 70 of us now. There are about 40 in Worcester and 20 of us here in Westboro down the street off of Route 9, and then there are about 10 in Boston. So because there are so many lawyers, everybody gets to specialize. And this is what I do is I do elder law because I'm so old. I, I, my, my median client age is 74. As I tell people, um, I like my work because my clients still think I'm young. You know, the, the new ones, they just think I'm a dinosaur. So um, this, I try to do every year at the beginning of the year uh, uh, an update. Uh, and this is, so this is Elder Law 101, the 2018 edition. But I realized that what you really want as part of that update is not just how the laws have changed, but also perhaps what I have learned, that is how my perspective has changed on particular areas. And so we've got a couple of those that I'm going to be talking about. Um, you've all met, if you've been here before, my friends uh, Frank and Mary, my make-believe couple, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. You've always heard me do the joke that if you get that joke, that means that you're old enough to be my client. You know, the young ones, they're like, so Peter, Paul, who? You know. So, um, as, and as you've heard me say before, their goal in life, Frank and Mary's, is they want to live, die, or live and die in their house and be buried in the backyard. And so the question is, how do they get there? And they come to me typically because they've got three kinds of questions. Uh, dealing with life, dealing with death, dealing with life after death, and dealing with what remains. So we're going to talk about all of those. Uh, we're going to start off about dealing with life. Uh, because, and these are in many ways the most important. You know, people come in wanting to talk to me a lot about death and what happens after death and how assets get dealt with and all those issues. And those are certainly important. But in terms of your life, your life is really important because in just about no version of, no, of, of what happens after you die, do you really care after you die about what is going on? But the stuff about when you're alive is really important. So while you're alive, in terms of dealing with the bank and going to the doctors and paying your taxes and all that stuff, you want to make sure that you get it right. And there are only a few things that you need in order to get that right. And I'm going to talk about these a little more in depth than usual because I want to talk about how these forms play out in conflict situations. Um, I'm, I'm going to get to that. So a healthcare proxy. So you have to have a healthcare proxy. Raise your hand if you have one. Healthcare proxy, that's great. Everybody should have one. Um, copies are valid, by the way. You don't have to have your original with you all the time. And the best place to keep one of your originals is bring it to your doctor. So your doctor can scan it in. So if you're in the emergency room or you're traveling or whatever, they can contact the doctor. The doctor can email it. It's not a problem. Um, uh, to be valid, the proxy has to be signed by two witnesses. Anybody can be a witness except one of the people who is named as your proxy. Um, you can revoke your proxy at any time by simply saying that you revoked it uh, or by making a medical decision contrary to what your proxy says. So if you're in the room with your doctor and your proxy and even the doctor, has, though the doctor has said you're not capable of making a medical decision. If the doctor says, I think we ought to operate and your proxy says, no, nah, I don't want you to operate. You can say, yes, I do. I want the operation. And the effect of that legally is that you just revoked your proxy. There's actually case law on that. Similarly with going to a nursing home. Some people won't, will, are nervous that their proxy might let them, put them into a nursing home and they'll say, I never want to go. Well, the answer to that is that if you're going to the nursing home with your son or daughter who is bringing you and you get to the door and say, I don't want to be here, that has the legal effect of revoking the proxy. And they can't put you in the nursing home without a court order in the event of that. Um, there is always a presumption of competence for purposes of your revoking the proxy, so you can always revoke it. Uh, and you want to have it because the alternative, if you haven't, is guardianship. I was just talking to someone at Milford Hospital as we were talking about really doing a kind of a concerted effort in one of their communities, that, one of the communities that, where the ambulance always takes you to the, that hospital, to try to get everybody to do one who's over a particular age. And, and one of the stories that one of the people at the hospital said was said, you know, remember so-and-so? And, and he, you know, he arrived a month and a half ago, and he didn't have a proxy, and we still got him. And, there's, and because he can't make any decisions, no one can make a decision for him, so the hospital is having to go through this guardianship process to get somebody named so that that person can make a decision regarding what, what happens to this guy. So uh, it's a big deal. That, but a couple of other things. Um, the, the, what the doctor is doing when the doctor is saying that the healthcare proxy is in effect 
and it's only effect in effect, even though you signed it a long time ago once the doctor does, does this, is he has to say in writing that you lack the capability to make or communicate health care decisions. Um, so one of the reasons why that's important is that in the, when, you, when you're naming your proxy, typically what you want that person to be doing for you, um, if you've got a medical problem, is talking to your doctor. Except that the proxy doesn't come into effect until the doctor has said that you lack the capability to make health care decisions. So actually, until that happens, your son or your daughter or your spouse can't talk to the doctor without violating HIPAA rules, the, the, the rules regarding medical confidentiality. So what you may want to be doing, and I'm going to mention this a little bit further on, is in addition to doing a medical proxy, to sign a separate release form um, to your proxy uh, or giving that to your proxy so that the, that person at any time can go to the doctor or go to the hospital and get your medical records and have a conversation with those people. So you may want to have that extra document. And I'm going to explain how, one of the reasons why that's really important a little later on. Now, you've all got a proxy. So how many of, do you, of you have in writing, in writing some instructions to that person regarding how you want to be cared for uh, if you are disabled? I count two. That's not enough. So the point of the proxy, I understand that we all think of the proxy as being about I just had a heart attack, I'm in the hospital, you know, somebody's got to make some decisions for me. But if you have a stroke, right, and, and now you're incapacitated, you could be incapacitated for a week, a month, a year, right? You may not be able to communicate for a long time. Um, one of the points of this program called Honoring Choices, which is a statewide program, we participate, a lot of other lawyers do, that it, it was started by a, this nonprofit, a woman named, uh, attorney named Ellen D. Piola is to try to encourage folks, once they've got that proxy, to actually sit down and have a conversation with the person they named and say, not getting into specifics because you don't know what the specifics might be. Because at this point, you're still healthy. You know, you're having this conversation. I mean, unless you have cancer, you know, and you, then you kind of know what you want to be talking about. Or you've got early stage dementia and you want to have that conversation. But in general, you just want to talk to them about what is valuable as far as you're concerned about living, besides the fact that your heart is breathing. And therefore, in the event that, that, that you were not able to communicate, not able to do certain things, is there a point at which you really don't want the doctors to go crazy about doing extra procedures for you? Are there some specifics that you do, things that you do want to do? That's what that's all about. And it's really, really important, and that's why I mention it again. And you, and, and they, you can check there. Um, they have a, a great website, and they'll, or we're happy to talk to you about this. So it's a really important, it's not legally binding, it's not legally binding. Living wills are not binding in Massachusetts. Uh, documents in which you leave instructions for someone about how you're going to be treated are not legally binding. So you're always advising your proxy, right? But, you, you know, and that's why you've got to trust, trust the proxy. So, um, that's the new form that I was just talking about, a HIPAA authorization, which you probably want to have. And, also, for, for those of you who, you know, oftentimes folks will come to me and they say, well, I really want all my kids named in my proxy. And I say, well, no, actually, you can only name one at a time. Because if you're incapacitated and I'm the doctor, I don't want to be having, hearing an argument among your kids about what to do. I only want to talk to one. But what you can do, if you want to make sure all your kids are participating, is give each of them a HIPAA authorization so that any one of them can talk to your doctor at any time or can get the medical records and kind of have, have those conversations, okay? Um, the CARE Act, now this is new. Um, this was, the uh, CARE Act was adopted by the legisla state legislature in 2016, came into effect this year. And what it says is if you go to the hospital, um, then the hospital is supposed to inform you that you have the right to name someone, uh, a designated caregiver who can be a family member, could be the person who is in your proxy, doesn't have to be. And the point of that is that once that caregiver's name is on file for this period that you're in the hospital, and it only applies to hospitals, um, the hospital has to communicate with that person, A, to tell them when you're getting discharged, right? So that there's no surprises. We've, we've all heard cases like where people just pop out of the hospital now, you know? B, to, to explain to this caregiver what you're gonna need when you go home in terms of care. Now, certainly you're going to get VNA to come in and all this jazz, but to the extent that that discharge plan involves you at home 
needing someone who's going to dress a wound, someone who's going to do something that the VNA wouldn't necessarily do, the hospital's got to then explain how to do that to the caregiver. Right? That's, now the, so all of that is new. The point of this law, though, is that, of course, like so many of these laws, it was done as a standalone, doesn't connect it to the health care proxy statute or anything else. So the person you name might be the proxy or it might not be. Um, and, 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 and you just have to kind of figure that out. If you, were in, you went to the hospital and you were incapacitated, then your proxy in your role, if the doctor says you can't make a decision, could name himself or herself or someone else as your designated person. But the point is, this is set, the fact that you have a proxy doesn't mean that that proxy is automatically going to be do, taking this role for you. Okay, so that's new. Power of attorney, that's the, only, the other document that you have to have is a power of attorney because it allows someone to make legal decisions for you. Very straightforward, you don't need witnesses to do a power of attorney. You ha it should be in writing. Um, you don't need a notary, but you always should have one. You should always have this thing signed by a notary. Um, the reason is, you, you, if you've been here before, you've heard me do this standard story. My, one of my daughters once, who was now a lawyer, gave me a t-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the case of a power of attorney, the judge isn't like a real judge who would know what a valid power of attorney is. It's like the guy at the bank. If your daughter is going to the bank saying, you know, I want to be signing my dad's checks, and you hand the power of attorney, and he's like, nah, I don't know if this looks valid, you know? That's the reason why you also want it to be relatively new. We always suggest that powers of attorney get updated every five years, not because you're changing it, but just because you want it to look new and you want it to be notarized. Um, you can revoke your power of attorney at any time. You can name, as opposed to the proxy, you can name more than one person at a time. So you can say, I name my husband first and then my son and then my daughter, et cetera. Or you could say, I name my husband first and if he's not around, I name my two kids jointly. Jointly would mean that they both have to sign for you, or jointly and severally. Jointly and severally would mean either one of them could do it, so that if one's on vacation or one's far away, now you have two people who could handle things for you if there's an emergency. Um, so that's power of, of uh, attorney. Uh, finally, I just want to go back to another section of the healthcare proxy law. So when the, the, the determination is made by your doctor that you can't make that medical decision. Remember we went over that in that slide. According to the law, that, that decision is solely for the purpose of empowering an agent to make health care decisions pursuant to a health care proxy. When your doctor does that, he is not or she is not saying that you're incompetent, that you are unable to sign other documents like a power of attorney or a will or a deed. The reason why I mention that is that in the business, in the, le in the healthcare business, most of those players assume that. And it's because I've, I've been to medical institutions, I've been to hospitals, I've been to nursing homes, where the facilities folks will say, oh no, our person, he can't sign a power, power of attorney. The, power, the healthcare proxy has been invoked. Now invoked is not a legal term, it's this magic word that everybody has come to use to mean that the doctor has signed the form that says that you can't make a medical decision, right? But the point is, if the healthcare proxy has been invoked, that doesn't mean you're not competent to name somebody to handle your affairs for you. That's a very different kind of decision from, do I want to get this operation because I might have cancer? You know, that's a whole different level of complexity. You probably still have the competence to sign a will, right? Or you may. And, and, and only the person who is notarizing that document or the witnesses to it are the people who have to be deciding whether they feel that you're competent or not, right? So uh, that, that is of significance a little later on. So we are assuming up to this point that Peter, Paul, and Mary are all just nice people. You like all the kids and they're all getting along and, and isn't that great? Most families, many families, shouldn't, I shouldn't say most, many families have that. It's the greatest blessing you can have if you have it, right? Kids that you can trust and they all like each other. But, you know, suppose, you know, for, you know Peter isn't really so trustworthy, you know, after all. And he, but he's the oldest one and he's the one that everybody thought was going to be handling everything. So let me give you a case that happened this year. Suppose Mary dies and Frank has appointed Peter as the alternate on power of attorney and on the alternate on the health care proxy. That was the backup. And, and so, and Frank hasn't been doing great, so he moved to assisted living 
to the memory care unit because memory is not so great. He's still basically, he knows what he's doing, but you know, don't ask him what he had for breakfast. And, and, and in the meantime, Peter now has sold the house and taken charge of the money, the $1 million that the dad had in the bank and the investments and stuff, and now isn't talking to Paul or Mary, Jr. And it says it's none of their business because dad had appointed him to take care of all this stuff, right? The doctor has invoked the, invoked the healthcare proxy and Peter says that, that in, in, although the dad seems fine, and so Peter's not giving Paul or Mary any of the medical records or the ability to even go talk to the doctor. And so Paul and Mary Jr. come to me and they say, what can we do? What can we do? And, and, and that's an interest, that presents some interesting problems. What exactly can Paul and Mary Jr. do? First of all, I just want to mention, inevitably when they come in, they'll say, about, their, about Peter, isn't, this is elder abuse. Isn't this elder abuse? Well, let me tell you something. First of all, elder abuse is not a crime. You can't go to the police and say, oh, it's elder abuse. You can go to the police and say, someone's getting beaten up, you know, or, or, or it's fraud, but not elder abuse. Elder abuse is also not a cause of action. I can't, you can't sue one of your kids, or anybody else for that matter, and the grounds are elder abuse. Right? It doesn't exist as a cause of action. It may be, once again, it may be fraud, it may be something else. So that, that doesn't mean anything. Okay? Um, as to what the kids can do, well, one possibility, as I had mentioned uh, to, these, to these particular kids in this case, actually, was, um, was you can just go to your dad, in, as far as the medical records, right now, and have him sign a, medical, a new HIPAA authorization, one to each of you. And that way you get to go talk to the doctor and go talk to the hospital. Right? And then, and if you don't like what you're seeing in terms of the, you know, the way in which it was decided that your father was incompetent, well then you maybe want to have a conversation with, uh, with uh, Peter about that, or talk to a lawyer about having a conversation with, a, with the doctor about that, about how this all got determined, right? And you want to be emphasizing to all those players that the mere fact that the father um, is, not, is not competent to make a medical decision doesn't mean he can't do other things. And then, you know, what, what, what dad could do, what Frank could do, is he could revoke the power of attorney to Peter, because he can do that at any time. And remember, the mere fact that the health care proxy has been invoked is irrelevant to that. That doesn't mean he doesn't have the power to revoke the, uh, the, uh, the power of attorney. Now, in many cases, as in this one, as it happens, father didn't want to do that, because the father's could be a little bit intimidated by the son, you know, who's been kind of managing his affairs and stuff. And so, and, and so they said, oh, he'd never do that. I said, well, in that case, don't have him confront Peter at all, but have him do uh, a new power of attorney to you or to the two of you, right? Because you don't have to revoke his power of attorney in order to do a new one. You can have more than one power of attorney that's out there, as we talked about earlier. And that way, you, with that power of attorney, can go to the bank, right? Or on your dad's behalf, you can now talk to Peter, right? Say, so what's going on? Where's the money, right? What bank is it in, right? And once you find the bank, then you can talk to the bank because now you have a power of attorney, right? So, and, and as you're thinking about, or, I mean, the other, the final alternative, which is the hardest one, is, a con is you can try to get a conservatorship, which is if you, want con if you want to have the ability to manage someone's assets, you're looking for a conservatorship. If you want the ability to manage the person of somebody, to make a medical decision, whatever, then you need a guardianship, right? So, and I'm gonna answer all questions at the end. So, so there are a number of things you could do, but, what, but also thinking back to what they could have done. Perhaps when Frank was doing this power of attorney, it would have been really handy if instead of just naming one child as the alternate on the power of attorney, he had named more than one of them jointly and severally, so that each of them can act independently, so that, so, that there is, so that there are other players that have access for the bank accounts, and so that there, there doesn't arise, and this happens, you know, this kind of suspicion, even when nothing bad has happened, this suspicion about what's going on, okay? So, once again, two relatively simple documents when you think about it, but, but there may be some aspects to them that, that you may want to tweak based on kind of thinking out some situations where some bad things happen. Now, once again, the reason why you don't want to go through a guardianship or a conservatorship 
you need a doctor's certificate, first of all, in order to start saying that the person is really incompetent, which most doctors are very hesitant to give. Even that doctor that signed the healthcare proxy in invocation is often hesitant to do this. Um, then you need to go to court, you've got to give notice to everybody, you've got to start paying a lawyer. These, these numbers, if you're fighting in court over these issues, this is big money. I mean, when I say big money, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, not unusual, because you've got a bunch of lawyers all having to go to court at once. In that situation, probably the court would require that a, another lawyer, suppose Peter or Paul and Mary had one and Peter had one, the court would probably require that one be appointed for the father or for the mother make sure that his interests were represented. And if there's a lot of fighting, the court will probably not name either one of those people, but name a third party, probably a lawyer as the guardian or conservator. They're going to be impartial, but they're not going to be cheap, right? So if you can figure out a way out of this, it's really beneficial to do it. Now, what about the reverse situation? Suppose Peter really is trustworthy, but Paul and Mary, eh, maybe they got some problems. So suppose that Mary had died and that Peter is the, is the trustee for the benefit of, of, um, of um, Frank. Um, and Paul and Mary are broke and have got, some, or got financial problems. And suddenly they're showing up a lot at the house. Oh, you know, I don't think Peter's doing such a great job, you know? And I think, you know, maybe I should be taking care of this. Or just saying, Dad, you know, I really, you know, they're going to foreclose on my house. I really need a check, right? And so Peter's really worried about this, right? Because he could see that this kind of, they're circling here. And what can he do? Well, one of the things that he could do, if he's got the power of attorney, is, and we did this, we did this actually twice last year, it's, it's, or, you know, in different situations. We had the, uh, the, I did it once on Nantucket where there were no kids, there, were, there was like one niece who was the one kind of solid person these folks had retired to Nantucket, so they didn't know anybody there or they didn't have any family there. They were both, the husband and wife, really kind of incapacitated. And suddenly there are these people around, you know, oh, you know, I, we can take care of this for you and we can manage this $3 million house and take care of this and that, you know. So, so what we did in both of these cases is we created a trust. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people, a trustee and a beneficiary or more benef one or more beneficiaries. And, and we had the, the, the person with the power of attorney then transfer all the assets to himself or herself as the trustee of the trust. So there's, and the trust is for the benefit of the old person. So there's no question about they're stealing the money, that like Peter's trying to steal the money, because it's in trust only for the benefit of the old person, and the trust would say that following the old person's death, the assets get divided according to the old person's last will and testament. So that there's no question about, oh, he's just doing it in order to get the assets himself. But once that's done, even if um, Mary, in a bad, on a bad day, gives somebody else a power of attorney, right, or revokes the old power of attorney, now the assets are all safe. They're all in trust. And if Paul or Mary want to try to get access to those assets or claim that Peter is really the one with the horns and not the one with the halo, they've got to go to court. So it's a, it's a handy way when you get into, because I've, I've seen those kinds of battles too, where literally powers of attorney are being adopted and revoked every week. Somebody goes in, oh, blah, 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 all of a sudden there's a new, there's a revocation, there's a new power of attorney. So it, 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 it eliminates that problem, okay? So that's kind of an, those are kind of interesting things from last year that I learned that you may want to be sensitive to. Mass Health 101, uh, you, if you've been here before, Nothing has changed. Um, I had thought, and I told folks here last year, for sure there was going to be a major change because in November of 2016, MassHealth had proposed a huge set of new regulations changing a lot of the regulatory scheme regarding how you qualify for MassHealth. And so I had gone over several of those changes and rated them regarding what are the chances of getting passed and what might happen. Nothing has happened. They were supposed to be in effect by February of 2017, still nothing has happened. So I can't tell you that anything ever is going to happen. I, I just have no idea now. So I'm just going to go over once again the basics of this. That's Frank and Mary. They own a house with $300,000. He's got an IRA of 150. They've got an annuity worth 100. He's got they got bank accounts of 75. So they got total assets of $625,000. Frank's Retirement account, Frank's got uh, uh, $1,500 a month coming in from Social Security and $500 from a pension. 
Mary gets half of Frank's or 750 in Social Security, so their income is okay. Say Mary needs nursing home care tomorrow. Does, are they going to need to spend any assets at that nursing home before Mary can qualify for mass health? Anybody think they do have to spend any assets? That's all because you've been here before or you're afraid to raise your hand. Because the, the answer to that is they don't. They don't. And the reason for that is that the medic, mass health rules, and they, these are all still in effect, is that for Mary to qualify for mass health, and once she has qualified for mass health, she'd have to pay her income to the nursing home, that's $750 a month that we saw, but MassHealth will pay all the rest, okay? In order for her to qualify, all she has to do is transfer all of her assets to Frank, because while she can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets, Frank can own the house no matter what it's worth. I deal with this all the time in Nantucket. $3 million house, doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference. The house is safe if the, if the other spouse is living in it, okay? Transfer the house, transfer all the money, Mary or, or, or Frank has, has the right to keep as much as $123,600. Um, not more than that, but he can have unlimited income. So once he's got all the assets, so day one, all the assets get transferred to Frank. Day two, he turns around and buys an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So in this example, remember Frank, they had a house worth 300,000, they had other assets worth 325, the total was 625. So in this example, we'd shift everything to Frank, Frank would keep say $100,000 of the 325, take the rest of the 225 and buy an annuity that has those characteristics. The day after he buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. From then on in, she pays her monthly Social Security to the nursing home. Mass Health pays the rest. Now, the only thing to note about that system, and, and, and in that case, as long as Frank does the right thing in terms of his will, which we'll talk about, Mass Health will never collect on any, any of that from those assets. The only thing to remember is, if Frank has bought that annuity, Mary has gotten on Mass Health so that Mass Health is now writing these big checks to the nursing home every month. And Frank then dies before he's received all of his annuity payments, because remember he's getting these annuity payments once a month during that term. Then Mass Health will have a lien on the remaining annuity payments to get repaid. So in this situation, if Frank needed to buy that annuity, what we would advise him to do is make the annuity term as short as possible. It can't be longer than his life expectancy, but it can be as short as he wants. And the reason for that is, once he's got the money back, he can protect it. As long as, he can't protect it without avoiding probate, but he can protect it. All he has to do is have a will that says that the assets that would have gone to Mary will instead be held in trust for her benefit. He can name his kids as the trustees, he can give them complete discretion to use the money to supplement her care in any way. But as long as he structured it that way, whatever he dies owning that goes through that will into that testamentary trust is going to be non-countable as far as Mary is concerned and non-lienable after Mary dies. So all the assets are safe. So as long as you've got two people, Frank and Mary, you don't have to really worry about nursing home issues. Uh, what happens though if Frank has died and now Mary is just alone and she needs nursing home care? That's a problem if he, she has inherited all the money. That's a problem, and when I say stay tuned, that's because that's the next seminar, right? I'm gonna just talk about these issues, the, the, the way that, that tax and other issues affect single people in the next presentation I do, which will be, I think, in a couple of months. I can't tell you the date. So stay tuned on that. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about taxes. So in 2017, there were some changes to the, to, to the tax code, as many of you have heard, this gigantic bill. And you're saying to yourself, but that didn't affect me in any way, did it? Well, I'm just going to mention a couple of things. Uh, one, effectively, as of, this, as of this point, as a result of some of this, there is no gift tax. Now, there is no Massachusetts, for, before, I, before I go through this, so there's no Massachusetts gift tax. Um, there is a federal gift tax. Uh, but so how many, does anybody here think that if you give one of your kids or somebody else more than $15,000 a year in a year, something bad happens? Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Do you know what it is? No. <laughs> the answer is nothing. Nothing bad happens, right? 
Uh, the reason for that is that well, there is no Massachusetts gift tax. Right? Um, there is a federal gift tax um, it, it, on the money that you pay if you give somebody more than $15,000 in one year and you have not exhausted your lifetime exclusion, which is an addition to that $15,000 a year, and which as a result of the change in the tax code is now $11 million. $11 million. So if you've got more than $11 million, come and talk to me. Right? I'd be glad to help you out. If you don't, just forget about the, this gift tax. So you can just give away as much as you want anytime. Right? People regularly ask me, can I just give, you know, give my kids some money? Sure. How much can I give them? As much as you want. Come on. Yes, as much as you want. Anytime. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in terms of the, the, the Massachusetts estate tax. But that's just the kind of the general rule. The only thing that you want to be careful about is you, you don't probably want to give them stuff that, has a, that is a capital gain asset, an asset that you've bought low and that you could sell high. Because the difference if you buy low and sell high after you've held it for at least a year is called a capital gain. And if you, and, and, and so I'll give you the example of how this works just to make sure we're all clear. So Frank and Mary, say Frank and Mary have got that house, right? They got that $300,000 house. So suppose they bought that house many years ago for $50,000. And, and it's now worth $300,000. So this is an unusual, right? So their tax basis in that house is $50,000. The capital gain that they earn if they sell that property for $300,000 is the difference between sales price and basis. Technically, it's adjusted sales price minus commissions. Forget all that for the time being. It's sales price minus basis. So three hundred dollars minus fifty dollars is $250,000. And so in general, if they were selling that house, they would have to pay a capital gains tax, federal and state. And then federal is about 15, state's about five. So the percentage would be about 20% or $50,000. So if they were selling their cottage on the Cape um, and they hadn't depreciated or done anything else fancy, th that's what they would pay in capital gains tax if they bought for 50 and they sold for 300. Now, the thing though about selling your house is the, uh, the, and a how your, your home is defined as the property in which you have lived for at least for two, at least two of the last five years. The thing about selling that is that when you sell that, you get an exemption from that capital gain. As an individual, it's 250000 If it's a couple, it's 500000 So in this case, Frank and Mary, if they sold their house, wouldn't pay any capital gains tax because they got a $500,000 exemption and they only made two fifty, dollars right? But if they gave it to their kids and then the kids sold it, whether it was before or after they died, the kids, unless they were living there, that's the kind of the general exception. If you're giving it to your child who's living with you, then there's really no issue here, right? Um, but, as long, but unless they were living there, they would pay a $50,000 tax. If, on the other hand, they held that house until they died, or at least kept an interest in it, this is the reason why many people will deed out to their kids a so-called remainder interest in the house, keep a life estate, so they kept some interest in the house. Then, upon their death, the tax basis jumps to the date of death value. It's, it's called a step up. It steps up to the date of death value. So that if their kids then get the house through the will or whatever and go to sell it, they pay zero in capital gains tax. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So if you're thinking of making these kinds of gifts, the best things to give are the things, are your money that you've already paid taxes on, you know, just the stuff that's extra, kind of, I want to say extra money, but money you've paid taxes on. Okay? Uh, now, the Medicaid deduction, or excuse me, the Medicaid deduction, the medical deduction for seniors. Actually, in general, the medical deduction increased last year as a result of a, of a change in the law advocated by this wonderful senator from Maine, Susan Collins, most wonderful senator, solid, middle of the road. I don't mean to be, right, but just a wonderful person. So anyway, she actually increased the medical deduction for people specifically because she was very concerned about seniors. And she realized that, the, that people, the people who use this the most are seniors. And so it used to be that the threshold before you could take a medical deduction was your medical bills had to be higher than 10% um, of your income. And she had that decrease to 7.5%. So now if your medical deduction, so you make $100,000, if your medical expenses are more than $7,500, then you can deduct them all, right? 
And you'd say to yourself, but why is that significant to me, right? Because you don't make $100,000, right? And, and how could you have all of that? Because you got Medicare, right? So let me talk about this a little bit. Because, you know, I talk a lot about mass health, so I talk about a lot about, lot about long-term care services, both services at a nursing home and for people who want to stay home, the vast sums that people pay to home care and other providers in order to stay home. So if you um, have a qualified long-term care services expense, that's a medical deduction. Well, what's that? It's an expense that is incurred if your situation is you have a substantial, you need substantial assistance with at least two ADLs, activities of daily living, and there they are. Eating, transferring, toileting, bathing, dressing, continence. Any two. Substantial assistance. Doesn't mean you need to have somebody with you there all the time, right? Or that you need a wheelchair in order to get around. You need what somebody's going to call substantial assistance. Who's that? Or, or, or by the way, or, or you need substantial supervision for your health or safety. Not necessarily because you've got a cognitive problem, just for your health or safety. So those are pretty broad. So who decides whether you need substantial assistance for either of those things? A licensed care practi health care practitioner can be a doctor, a nurse, a licensed social worker, right? This is pretty flexible. And the IRS has been very flexible in the interpretation of this. So if you're in a situation where you've got, you want to stay home and you're still at home and you've got you know, home care being provided, whether it's making meals, doing this, doing that, you want to look at this and see if there is a case that can be made that you need some you know, substantial assistance with these two ADLs um, or that you, know, you need some supervision, because if that's the case, all this money gets deducted. It's a medical deduction. It's really huge. In addition, you should understand, um, so it covers you know, necessary diagnostic, preventive, blah, 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 and maintenance and personal care services. Finally, if you move to assisted living and it is determined by a doctor, in this case it has to be a doctor, that um, you, you should go there, so you did this at the doctor's suggestion, if, 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 the, if the suggestion was directly related to your condition, and remember we already talked about what the condition has to be, right? And if the doctor says that it was efficacious, what's that, right? In helping you to be more safe than you were at home, I, you know, I don't know, right? Then 100% of the assisted living bill is a medical deduction, right? So, so what is the major reason why people don't, you know, even if they don't, they don't feel safe at home anymore, don't go to assisted living is because the, the bill is so high, you know, three to seven thousand dollars a month, I've seen as high as ten, right? But if you can do this, all of a sudden it's a medical deduction, right, which means that, among other things, if you, if you take some of your tax deferred money, which is what mo a lot of people have got, I and mean, they're large amounts of money, or if you take, if you're selling stocks or bond, or stocks or stocks, so that you're hitting a capital gain, suddenly you're getting to not have to pay tax on any of that, right? Because it's balancing out with your medical deduction. You're simply used to the extent that you're using that money to pay the, the assisted living facility or to pay for your medical expenses. It's all a medical deduction. So you're getting to use 100 cents of your dollar as opposed to taking it out as income, paying income tax on it, and only being able to use the rest. You know what I'm saying? Now, but you'd say to yourself, but gee, I'm not really in that high a tax bracket. You know, I'm a senior, I don't make that much money. Well, now here's an interesting thought. What if, in, you, you're, so you've decided you're going to assisted living or you've got a ton of care that's happening at home. Because if you had 24-7 care at home at about $25 an hour, which is about what the cost is right now, and there are 8,760 hours in a year, trust me, um, that's about $200,000 a year. So this is big money, right? More expensive than the assisted living. So if you're paying that kind of money, or, sorry, or suppose you're just in an assisted living. Say you're paying $100,000 a year in assisted living. Not an unusual number. Suppose that instead of doing that, you gave that money to Peter. You gave that money to Peter. Now remember, you can give him as much as you want, right? We already talked about that. No tax. And by the way, he doesn't pay a tax for getting it because the receipt of a gift is not income. Okay? And suppose he then paid your $100,000 bill to be in the assisted living. Well, as long as a taxpayer 
is paying for more than 50% of the expenses of a dependent. If that dependent is, among other people, a is a qualified relative, which includes spouse, parent, aunt, uncle, that's pretty broad, it includes some others too, but I just did the most common, right? Then you become a dependent. Then in that case, Frank or Mary or the boats would become a dependent of Peter for purposes of the use of the medical deduction. So now it's his medical deduction. And so if, say, Peter and his wife together are making $165,000. Now, once again, I still, I'm so old that that still seems like a lot of money. But I talk to my kids, you know? And the two, everybody, they're both working, and this is not an unusual thing, that they're making this kind of money between them, right? If they're making $165,000, they're in a 22% federal tax bracket. They're in a 5% Massachusetts bracket. So they're, gonna, they're paying a total of 27% in taxes. So if Peter, if you give, if Frank and Mary give $100,000 to Peter, and he turns around and pays the assisted living for a year, and, and, the, and one of the parents qualifies for this whole medical deduction because of what we went through, he's getting $27,000 back in, tax, in taxes, right? $27,000. Now, if he's, you know, if you trust him, <laughs> right, then you're trusting that what he's going to do with that $27,000 is he's going to kind of leave it aside for you, right? So that it basically extended your money, right, where you thought you were going to have to pull your money out, especially if it was, if it was, if, you know, if, if you, and you were going to just be spending all this hundred thousand dollars. Now you give it, you give the same hundred thousand to him, him, he covers your care for a year and he's still got another twenty-seven thousand dollars to spend on you, right? Isn't that an interesting notion? Um, so that's life. So dealing with life after death. This one's really short. Uh, not my problem. And, and also not yours, because of course at this point you're going to dead, so we want to keep remembering that, right? But, but, but that said, the remaining questions are uh, dealing with the remains, or what remains, which is among other things, the remains, right? Which is you, your body after you die, which instantly becomes defined as the remains. So there are two things you need to know. Your proxy uh, has the right to give away your body or any pieces of it that he thinks are appropriate to give to the New England Organ Bank. And as a matter of fact, the New England Organ Bank, if you die in a hospital or in a nursing home, they won't release the body until the New England Organ Bank has said okay. Because it's presumptive that the New England Organ Bank has, has the right to your body parts, even though you didn't sign a form or do anything <laughs> special. This law changed a couple years ago. Um, so so you, if, if you've got a concern about that, you want to tell your proxy that. Because your proxy can just say no. Um, but you want to let him know that he thinks that's of importance. The rest of your remains uh, would be shipped back to the, to the wherever, the funeral home or wherever. Uh, and then regarding what happens to those remains, um, you, can in, you can in writing put down what you want to have happen. It doesn't have to be part of your will. Just be a separate document. It ought to be in writing. It ought to be in a place where somebody can get to it quickly. Right? Um, if, you, if you have a will and you don't have a, if you have a will, the person who is named as the personal representative, used to be called the executor under the will, uh, is in control of those, of executing your plan regarding the remains. If you don't have a will, then it's either your spouse or your kids. But if you've got an issue, once again, if, everybody, if there's any dysfunction at all in that family, you don't want this to be the cause of more dysfunction. You want to write, write it down. Write it down. What do you really want to have happen to your remains? I know it's kind of an awful thought, but you know, Guaranteed it's going to happen, you know, could be now, could be much later. So you may want to think about doing that. Um, then there's the issue of the assets, dividing up the assets. Now, once again, in this case, Peter Paul or, and Mary Jr. were supposed to just split up the assets, and that was always Frank and Mary's plan. Uh, if they own assets in their own name, if, if one of them dies and everything is joint, which is usually the case, then the other spouse gets everything. Because legally, if you own something jointly with somebody else, you each own all of it. You each own 100%. So if one person dies, that person's interest evaporates. The other person becomes the sole owner. So that's why probate isn't usually relevant if, if when one spouse dies. When the second spouse dies, though, if you actually own something, typically that's the house, then th that asset, we need to figure out who gets it. And that's what pro the probate process is about. It's the process of figuring out who gets what and, and more importantly, as far as the state is concerned, making sure that the creditors get paid before anybody else gets paid. 
And that's the reason why a probate typically takes, it has to take more than a year because creditors have one year from the date of your death to file a claim against the probate estate. So if you want to avoid, if, if, if you're concerned about having a will, but you're Frank and Mary and what, you're, what you want to have happen is if one of you dies, the other one gets everything, and the other one dies, it goes to the kids. Well, you don't need a will for that. That's actually what the rules of intestacy are in Massachusetts. One spouse dies, the other spouse gets it. The two spouses are dead, goes to the kids, right? If you want to avoid probate completely, then you've got to do something else. You've got to make sure that you don't own anything just in your name at the time of your death. One possibility, um, uh, and by the way, th people always say, oh, I need a will, or I need this or that, otherwise the Commonwealth's going to get it. Commonwealth never gets it. Commonwealth only gets the assets if they can't find an heir. If there is money, there will be an heir. Trust me. Always, always somebody shows up. So don't even think the Commonwealth's ever going to get the money. But the point is, if you want to avoid probate, then you, you may want to think about doing a trust. Typically, in this case, if you're not doing it for mass health purposes, you would name yourself as the trustee of the trust so that you're in control while you're alive. You'd probably name, though, one of your kids as the successor after you die or after you and your spouse die so that at, at the moment of your death, the trust becomes irrevocable, so because, obviously because you can't revoke it because you're dead. So, and then, but the new trustee steps in immediately. Nothing goes through probate, and the trustee can divide up all of the, all of the assets. Um, so that's how you avoid it. Joint ownership, trusts. Um, letter, regarding your personal property, uh, the stuff in the house, not, don't tell, not the car, the stuff in the house. Technically, that's supposed to go through probate. It never does. It never does because the, kid, the kids divide it up, right? Or they throw it away. And who, in either case, whoever's getting it, you know, if I'm getting your bedroom set, if, either because I'm buying at a yard sale or I'm inheriting it, if I'm getting your bedroom set at the yard sale, I'm not asking somebody for a certificate of title regarding the bedroom set. I'm just taking the bedroom set and I'm paying the money, right? So, so that's why the personal property, there's never an issue that personal property, you need probate for that. The only issue is the car. Because the car has a title to it. You know, car and like bank accounts and stuff, because they too have titles to them. A car has a title. And so you can't, if, if you die and you're the sole owner of the car, the registry of motor vehicles won't issue a new title to anybody unless you go in with a certificate showing you've been appointed as the personal representative under the estate, right? So I can't tell you, that's probably the most common reason why sm otherwise small estates where people really thought they had avoided probate still have to be probated. It's the deal with the car. So if you want to deal with that issue, you can't put it in trust. Registry will not allow a car to be registered in trust. Um, you ha so you have to find one of your kids and name put the car jointly in names with one of your kids so that when you die, your interest evaporates, the, other ki the kid becomes the owner. Now, if your child is like, geez, dad, you're a terrible driver. I don't want to do that. You so you're going to get an accident. I'm going to get sued. Well, then increase your insurance. Right? But, that's, but if, you're, if, he's really, if you're really interested in avoiding probate, that's, that's, how, you, that's how you do it. Um, the Massachusetts estate tax, briefly. So the federal estate tax is completely irrelevant now. The Massachusetts estate tax, though, is still very much in play. Um, if, one, if Frank or Mary dies and leaves everything to the other, um, there is a 100% marital deduction in the Federalist, in the Massachusetts estate tax, so that there's never an estate tax to the second one or to the first one. If, if, if Frank dies and leaves everything to Mary, though, and she dies the next day and she has more than a million dollars, there will be an estate tax, the taxable estate. So if the taxable estate is a million dollars or less, um, there's no estate tax. If it's more than that, if it's a million one, for example, the estate tax is $40,000. Which means, as a practical matter, the estate tax is 40% the marginal rate on that first 100,000. For that extra 100,000, you're paying 40,000 in tax. The, for the next, for the, excuse me, for the, the next 100,000, between 1 million one and 1 million two, it only increases to 49,040. So the additional, the increment is only another $9,040, or about 9%. For the next one, from a million two to a million three, it only increases by about 6%. So if you've got a lot of money, uh, the effect of shrinking your estate in order to avoid the estate tax is fairly small. If, you're with it, if you've got a million one, though, it really benefits you to try to get it down below a million dollars. Because that's a, you know, you're, you're, by giving the, the, the 100000 away early, um, you may be saving. 40000 of that would have been paid to the government. So you probably want to talk about that. So 
Um, and, and, and in general, how do you do that? How do you avoid that tax? Well, you can just give it away. We already talked about that, right? Say, say you've got an estate of a million seven and you want to give, some, give 100,000 to your kids. So now you've only got a million six. You didn't pay any tax, any, any gift tax on that. The kids didn't pay any income tax. And you just shrunk your estate tax by about $6,000, right? By about $6,000. So in general, the easiest way to reduce the estate tax is just give stuff away, right? Now, I'm just going to, and you always save money by giving stuff away. I'm just going to mention, though, and this is where you want to be taught, in this particular case, you want to be talking to, to a, your, your, your lawyer or your accountant. If you, for various reasons, if you had an estate of a million two, say, and you wanted to get it below the million dollars, right? Um, and so you gave away $400,000, leaving you with only $800,000 left, right? And then you died. And you hadn't given away that $400,000 in increments of less than $15,000 a year per person. To the extent that you didn't give it away that way, the state would say, for purposes of deciding whether you have to file a gift an estate tax return, they're going to make you add that back in. So say that you had to add it all back in. So now your estate is back at a million two, right? Now, the estate tax that you're going to pay is only on what you still have, the remaining $800,000. But there is going to be an estate tax. The mere fact that you have less than a million doesn't exempt you because of the fact that, that you, you, you had to add the other money in for purposes of deciding whether you had to file. That's a, that's a very narrow exception to my general rule, which is give it away. Right? When in doubt, give it away. The best thing about giving it away, among other things, is they get to say thank you, right? Because in no, in no theory of your being dead, after you're dead, do they get to say thank you anymore that you can hear them? You know? So that's a possibility. You just give it away. Um, so one way is to give it away. The other way, if you're, if you, if you're married and you have an estate where between a million and two million, for example, um, the most common mechanism, in, to, so in, in if, in if Frank dies and leaves everything to Mary and now she's got $2 million, her estate tax is going to be about uh, $70,000 around. Um, you, he can eliminate that. Or they, they can eliminate that by having Frank in his will or in his trust or whatever say that up to a million dollars of the money that he was going to leave Mary, instead he leaves in trust for Mary. And, and depending on why he's doing this, he, in many cases, he can leave Mary as the trustee of that money. So she still has control of it. But if he does that, he effectively reduces Mary's estate by up to a million dollars. So you can end up with total assets of up to $2 million, not paying any estate tax. That one's a little complicated. And you, you know, if, you, if you're really interested in that, see me later or talk to your accountant. Uh, that's it. So those are the new things that happened this year. And that's what I learned this year. Any questions? No. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in those issues regarding kind of what happens in these kinds of situations when you're single, that's going to be the next episode. And uh, we'll see you in a few months. Thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat>